Let's do it. Hello, Finimizers. Welcome to another Finimize live event. My name is Stefan. I'm your Finimize analyst and host of today's event, How to Invest Like a Venture Capitalist. I have to say that one of the events that uh, I was the most looking forward to, super, super exciting stuff. So, 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 so glad to have all you here. I'm sorry I lost half of my voice. I was at a wedding in Ireland this weekend and I have to say uh, after all of the Guinness, uh, that was the, the price to pay. Anyway, now the fun stuff, uh, some housekeeping to run through first. Uh, so first, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Tell us where you're tuning in from. Hopefully there's gonna be some Irish today. Uh, and remember to switch to all attendees so everyone can see all of your messages. Uh, this is going to be a 15 minute conversation followed by a 15 minute audience Q&A. So basically make sure you use the Q&A box to ask a question. And if you see a question you like, you upvote it so it moves to the top. And that way, you know, we can get through the most upvoted questions first. All right, so let's kick this off. So our event partner today is Sweater VC. So Sweater vision is to pull money from millions of regular people into a world-class venture fund, wisely deploying that capital into startups that shape the world we live in. Every founder should be able to build their vision and every person should be able to support the startups that create the next generation of influence and wealth. So today I'm super, super excited to have the Jesse Randa, the founder and CEO of Sweater Ventures. So just a brief intro, after working in the space for 20 years, he founded the company in 2018 when he was trying to raise his own venture fund and he realized he did not qualify to invest in his own fund because he was not an accredited investor. Feel the pain. He decided to drop the idea of a traditional VC fund and work tirelessly with the SEC to identify a structure that would allow everyday investors access to the previously exclusive asset class. Prior to starting Sweater, Jesse learned the world of venture capital and startups by founding six companies and running a software accelerator where he had the opportunity to work with over 200 startups. So I think it's fair to say you're in very good hands today. First things first, how are you doing today, Jesse? I'm fantastic. It's, uh, it's had a good long weekend and uh, excited to kick this off and get moving. Let's jump in. Awesome. So how about, you know, you can maybe just start by giving us, you know, a very, very brief intro of Sweater Ventures and, you know, more importantly, sort of where it fits into, uh, you know, the VC landscape. Yeah, certainly. So uh, Sweater is, is actually a mobile app. So you could go download the app in either app store if you're located in the U.S. Uh, right now. And what we do is uh, we have lowered the barrier for people to be able to participate in the venture capital asset class. So all the big VC funds you see out there, the Sequoias and the Andreessen's and Benchmarks and whoever else that you might have heard of, to put money in those funds uh, is typically millions of dollars. And uh, so most of us can't afford to actually write the check to get in there. And even if you did have the money, you know, like there's some other qualifications around being accredited that might prevent you from participating. So we took all of that and we worked with the SEC to identify a fund structure that would allow anyone to participate, even if you're not wealthy. So when you go into the app, you, you can invest $500 instead of 500,000 and participate uh, alongside all the biggest funds out there. So we pool all of everybody's small checks together and we provide an experience of kind of like having courtside seats to the venture capital game through the mobile app. So uh, it's really, you know, more than just an investment. It's a whole community that we've built, a, a tight-knit community, if you will. And uh, we have a lot of fun, but we're also super serious about investing and making sure that we put your money to work in incredible world-changing venture-backed companies. Super exciting. To be honest, I'm 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 really looking forward to trying it out uh, as well. <laughs> okay, so you know I think most of our finimizers they're very familiar with uh, kind of public companies, uh, public investments. So how is investing, you know, in a private startup different from investing uh, in you know a more mature public company? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, there's there's a lot of differences. I, I think just the obvious one is companies aren't available to purchase their shares publicly until they've gotten really big. Uh, these days, I mean, companies are typically worth billions and billions of dollars when they go public and it becomes available for all of us. Um, and, and kind of the, the shortcoming or the problem with that is that the journey for a startup starts when they might be worth a few million dollars and they're backed by venture capitalists and angel investors who ride the wave of making them worth billions of dollars 
And they capture all of that value from that private growth phase that they're in before that company goes public. Um, and the trend is getting more acute over time. So companies are staying private longer and longer, which means more and more of their growth potential is being captured when they're still private. So that's a big reason to want to be invested in private companies because uh, the return profiles are a lot stronger than what you're kind of left with after they've gone public. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with being public or, or investing at that stage. It's just very different. And the return profile is just a different stage of the life cycle of a company. Great, great answer. Uh, th thanks for that. So, you know, what are the, the key factors really that, you know, VCs consider when evaluating uh, investment opportunities? And I think, you know, maybe we can hopefully link it back and, you know, make it useful for our audience and, you know, how they can potentially incorporate these principles into their own investment strategy. So, I mean, making investments in private companies is hard, right? There is a, a lot of variability and uncertainty in the future that a company is going to pursue. So the earlier that you invest in a company, uh, the more unknown the outcome is going to be. So if you invested a company in a pre-seed round, when they don't have any revenue, they don't have any product, they've just got a founder or a set of founders that have a big vision, you're betting almost entirely on the founding team and the nature of how their idea is positioned out in the world and how acute or how strong that pain is that they're solving, right? And so as, as an investor, you're trying to assess those two big things. As the company makes progress and goes from pre-seed to seed to series A to series B, the company gets de-risked and the, their future is much more at least predictable. Now, there's still a lot of risk associated with it. You could raise a $100 million series B and still fail. So it's not foolproof when you're later in the process. But you're also later in the process, and referring back to what I was saying earlier, you invest later in that private process, and your return profile is less than it would be if you invested at the very beginning. So you can kind of get the feel for that, the difference between risk and reward of when you're investing in those private companies. So I, I lay the stage that way because at the earliest stages, when you're looking at companies, you're almost, to me, 80 or 90% of the bet is on the founders and the fit of those founders solving the problem that they're going after. So you spend a lot of time with the founders, you try to understand their vision, you understand their drive and their motivation for solving this particular problem. And then you do have to do research in the market, make sure that problem is real, you know, and that they're not just making something up that people would potentially be willing to pay for that type of a product, or maybe they have early evidence of that. And trying to see if the opportunity is big enough, because one of the most important elements of being a venture backable company a VC would be interested in is that the company can get big enough, you know, investing in um, a single product company that you might see on kickstart um, probably can't get big enough by itself to provide venture level returns um, investing in a brewery or something like that. It's not going to bring back venture level. So when you're examining these early stage problems, that space has to be big enough that you can really, really grow in the long run. And so, a lot of that is like fine tuning as an investor that you've seen lots of deals, you've you've seen things that have worked and haven't worked. You have a feeling for um, the way that market trends are, are moving and the way the winds are shifting, you know, which is very much kind of an instinct thing. Um, and then the further you get along, the more that you're looking at like the actual traction, you're looking at the nature of the product and how they're solving the problem. Uh, you're looking at the competitive landscape and make sure that there's room out there and that you're well positioned to protect yourself, you know, and you're looking at more elements like that. Um, but, you know, we specialize in early stage. And so whether, you know, someone is looking at investing through Sweater and our VC fund to participate in the portfolio we create, or whether you're going to be an angel investor, both of those are at the earliest stages of a company. You really can't be an angel investor when a company is doing 50 million a year in revenue. That It doesn't work that way. You're getting in early because that's when there's an opportunity for it. So, um, you know, focusing in in that early stage, I think is probably what's relevant, the most relevant for everybody that's on the call right now. Now, you know, in, in public markets, we can probably get away with, you know, identifying good companies. I mean, at the end of the day, a good company will probably deliver kind of good, decent returns. Of course, you know, if you if you invest in, in early stage startups, what you're really after are those, you know, great, uh, great companies or exceptional companies. So, you know, in your view, what really differentiate a good company, good early stage company from a great or an exceptional one? Well, I think there's there's even more grades than just 
good and great. I think that there are a whole bunch of different striations inside the private world, you know? And like I was saying earlier, I mean, the whole notion of being venture backed means that you're in that upper strata, right? So I would say there's probably like at least four or five levels within that. And in the lower three, you really don't want to be down there as a private investor, unless you like have a personal connection with the founder and you're, you're helping them with something, or unless you have some dis disposable income, you may not ever want to see again. The likelihood of complete failure at that level is pretty high, um, or at least at a minimum, it's not reflecting the risk that you're taking. So if you go up into that upper third, say of companies that exist, and you look at good companies that are venture backable and exceptional companies that are venture backable, I think that a big line in between the two is the nature of what you're pursuing and the timing of what you're going after. Everyone's probably familiar with SaaS companies, right? It's like usually B2B software that you're using inside an environment. Um, and let's just say, like, let's go back in time a decade and remember when social media management was a big deal, you know, like businesses could get on Facebook, right? And Instagram was brand new and there was Twitter, you know, and it was a big um, movement at that moment in time to try to track what was going on as a company you're posting out there and trying to see analytics and trying to schedule your posts so that you could be more efficient. You know, in 2011 and 2012, that was a super hot opportunity. It was a moment in time. But if you jump to 2015, all of a sudden, you know, there's probably a hundred options out there. And even if you had the best idea in the world of how to do it a little bit better, there's no longer a really venture backable opportunity there. You might be able to squeeze in and have a good opportunity that can grow and be acquired, but it's not exceptional. The exceptional one would have been at the very beginning of that wave and having the ability to take advantage of that market and really um, have an explosive growth coming out the other side. So there are plenty of venture backable companies that are in the early days of uh, like are, are the first ones or very early in the stage of forming a new market space. And there are others that kind of follow on their heels and want to come up after them. And, you know, with reasonable differentiation and having a unique angle, but they're kind of attacking whoever led the market. And to me, that's the difference between a good venture investment and an exceptional venture investment, because exceptional ones have the ability to take an entire market, to create a whole new market space. So when you talk about the Airbnbs, you talk about um, the Ubers of the world, and you you know you look at the PayPal's and and those sorts of applications. They really broke ice on something that was truly brand new, which, for the record, is extraordinarily risky, and they're very very difficult to find. Uh, one of the things that I I want to inscribe on a wall here at work is you can't buy timing, and as an investor and as a founder, you you really can't. You can't say, hey, I want to go find the perfect timed company, right? And you're just looking for that. I mean, that's not like really a criteria that you can filter for. It's more about like experiencing what a founder is doing. And then you figure out that the timing may be happening. And that's the thing, like when Airbnb started, everybody told them they were nuts. Who's going to come and sleep on your couch? Nobody's going to do that. But what they didn't see was that there was a whole changing generation coming up behind them. Some investors understood it, but most rejected Airbnb because they thought the timing wasn't there, but they were wrong about that. So it's it's really hard to differentiate between all of that, right? I think that safe VC and angel investors will invest in kind of that second wave or maybe even the third wave of companies that are coming into a new space that's being built. But the very best investors and the very best opportunities are the ones that are creating categories. And it's really hard to know if they're creating a category or if they're just insane. Uh, it's a very fine line between the two. And one last question, actually, before we move to the to the to the Q and A. And by the way, don't forget to uh, to add your questions or vote for the different questions in the in the Q and A box when we um, when we move to the to the Q and A part. But I guess you know one question that that everyone is 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 asking right now is is you know what sort of trends or you know companies or areas or or themes that you know or, that you're really 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 excited about uh, you know from a from an investment perspective. Well, I think that it, you know, there's some obvious ones, you know, that I think there's some have fallen out of favor recently. So if you look at the NFT in the metaverse, you know, that was super about 24 months and all kinds of money was getting poured into it. And at least in the near run, this, this first wave of innovation didn't really catch. And so now everyone's backing off from it and they're a little bit, 
nervous about. I think there's some VC funds that are deeply committed, like Andreessen Horowitz is deeply committed to that whole space. Same thing with cryptocurrencies and blockchain in general. Um, you know, probably the hottest one right now is anything that deals with generative AI. Um, and it's 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 a weird one though to assess because it's hot, but at the same time, it's already there's so many copycats and fakes out there that it's hard to tell the difference between what's truly exceptional and what to have a hundred competitors in the next 12 months. And so it's uh, it's kind of a weird time in the AI space. I mean, and that's the thing, like today isn't that explosive timing uh, that, you know, AI is, is suddenly, you know, taking over the world. AI has been a conversation since like 2012. It's been around for a decade. You know, this generative AI is the, it has, has been the last eight or nine years of just heavy, heavy research and creating and trying to figure this out. And that was a breakout moment. So when you look at something like uh, like OpenAI and ChatGPT and everything that they're doing there, they are like the foundation or the, um, I guess, the core of a whole movement that's being built on top of it. And I'll just share one example that I think is interesting about that. And, and there are many other you know categories that are cool, but we'll just talk about this one for now. There was a really interesting um, concept that came out about this that I thought was interesting. That is, when you look back in time and you look at the person that invented refrigeration, that person made some money. They had patents on it. You know, they figured out how to make refrigerators work. This is 100 years ago or whatever it was. And they made some money. But you know what? who really made the money? It was the meat packers and, and people transporting um, you know, perishable goods and the people that learned how to leverage refrigeration to change entire industries. They're the ones that made tons of money. And so I look at generative AI and this whole space of what's coming around and be like, open AI is great. And yes, they're going to make billions of dollars, but there's going to be other entire industries that are completely upended when they figure out how to leverage that technology to change the way that we live. And we're at the front end of that, I think. And it's hard to predict exactly where it will go. And there's going to be a lot of red herrings all over the place of people saying that they're going to, but that's venture investing, like being able to differentiate and place your bets on the few that you think will make it most won't. Uh, but if you catch that one, you know, then it could take you to the moon. Um, but nobody knows when they make the investment. Nobody knows that it's going to go to the moon. Love that example with the refrigerator. Actually, that's one I'm, I'm definitely going to use again <laughs> going forward. Um, yeah. Now let's move on to the, to the Q&A. So the most voted question here, uh, has Sweater ever funded a big company when it was a startup? So Sweater is relatively young. Uh, we launched in June of 2022. So, uh, and with our focus being on early stage companies, um, our companies are pretty young. You know, we've we've made mostly seed stage investments. Uh, you know, companies are doing anywhere from, you know, 10 or 20,000 a month in revenue to, um, you know, maybe 10 or 15 million on the upper end is kind of like the bandwidth of like the types of companies that we've invested in, but they're still young. And so, you know, like our portfolio, when you go through and you go to the website or you go on the app and you look through the, the investments that we've made, um, you know, you're not going to see probably a bunch of big names that you would recognize right off the bat because we're starting before they become big names. You know, um, you know, nobody knew who Airbnb was until 2015. That, that was seven years after they were founded, you know, and so we're very much in that early stage and many of our portfolio companies will break loose and, and you'll know who they are. Um, but we're in the early stages of that. So uh, there has been, I mean, like within our thesis, we do reserve the right to uh, purchase what are called secondaries in late stage, high growth companies that you would recognize the names for. Buying secondaries basically means that like if a founder wanted to offload some of their ownership, they could sell it on the side and we could buy it from them and come in at whatever that valuation is when the company is more mature. Um, but with the volatility happening in a lot of uh, late stage evaluations that are resetting right now, we decided when we launched that we weren't going to touch it probably for the first 24 months, Did not touch late stage secondaries. Because when you're buying secondaries, I'm probably going too deep here, but when you're buying secondaries, you don't get access to due diligence and information that you would when you're part of a live round. And so by doing that, you're taking a big bet that you that the company's still moving in the right direction environment you just can't tell and so we've decided not to do it right now but in the future we certainly will and even further in the future we'll have dedicated funds that are only for late stage and that end up specializing in different verticals you know so you could come in and invest just in the climate tech fund just in the international fund just in the late stage fund just in the SaaS fund just in the impact fund and you could put your money to work with whatever you believe in the most 
Sounds exciting. Um, next question from Doug. What is your fee structure? Would you consider your investment appropriate for long-term investment or is it more of a speculative opportunity? Yeah, excellent question. Uh, so we're designed completely for the long run. Uh, our fund structure is different than traditional VC funds. And with, without getting too deep into it, um, our fund structure is almost more like a cousin to a mutual fund, which means that it's evergreen. So it's open forever into the future. So we're designed for, for the cashmere fund, which is our first fund to be open for the next 15 or 20 years. And we expect it to be that way. We'll make hundreds, if not thousands of investments into this initial fund. So yes, the entire thing is designed for a long-term mindset. Um, and there's way more that we could dive into and that we have information on the website for about that. In terms of our fee structure, our fee structure is also more reflective of the way that a mutual fund works. And it's different than a traditional VC fund. And again, without going too far down that rabbit hole, we basically have the same amount of fees that a traditional VC fund takes. We just do it in a different way over the same period of time and assuming the same amount of money that comes into each of those fund structures. We just are regulated a little bit differently. So uh, up front, we take a 2.5% management fee and we don't take any carried interest, which if you're familiar with the space is very different from a traditional VC fund. Um, but we are aligned in the long term to make good investments because as the value of our investments grows, that 2.5% management fee is tied to that growing value. And so we want to make good investments because that comes back to benefit us just like it comes back to benefit our investors. Thanks for that answer. <clears throat> Next question. Um, what is the firm failure rate for typical VCs? I am aware that VCs and private equity invest widely with the hopes of a few large winners. Does this strategy apply for sweater? Mm-hmm. So, and that question is specific to funds themselves, like fund failure, right? Did I hear that right? I, I guess the underlying question is, you know, you, you you invest in 10 companies, nine of them will fail or eight of them will fail. How many of them will fail? And, and you know, how can you, like, what's the failure rate? Yeah. Like, how many companies succeed? Yeah, so let me answer that from two directions. So I think that it's important to talk about company and startup failure rate. It's also important to talk about funds and how funds perform by investing in startups. So let's start with startups. Uh, you know, rule of thumb is 50 to 60% of startups that uh, it, that VCs or angels invest into are going to fail and just assume that they go completely to zero. Now, there's a lot of variance in that, but generally speaking, just write them off. You've got another 10 or 15% that will return, you know, the original capital, maybe return 2x that capital. And then you've got a, a chunk that will do like 2x to 5x. And then you've got a smaller chunk that will do, you know, maybe 10x. And then you have this ability to have breakaway ones that will return 50x or 100x. And so that's like the 1%. So, you know, you look at that math and you can't just go make five investments and expect to get good returns. That's why venture investing in private startup investing is really hard. You need to know what you're doing. You need to know what you're looking for. You need to avoid all the landmines. And that's why we do professional diligence on every company, because there's a lot of this stuff that could be avoided. But some just, you know, the vast majority of them isn't because the founder did something sketchy. It's because, um, you know, or that things were set up wrong. It's because the company itself just couldn't find its place in the market. And so they end up failing or being acquired for a very small multiple. Um, so that's another reason to invest into a fund because the fund is making a portfolio and diversifying that risk across a lot of companies. So a typical VC fund will make investments. So if we switch to the other side and let's talk about fund returns, the typical VC fund will make two or three dozen investments inside its fund life cycle, which is usually about three years that it deploys it in. They call that a vintage, right? So the time period that it's deployed in. And 50% of VC funds outperform public markets. There's some really good data around that. So you got a 50-50 chance that your money is going to do better than if you just put it into you know, uh, an ETF that's tracking the S&P 500, right? So you got a 50% chance you're going to outperform. But that also means you got a 50% chance you're going to underperform. And of those, you know, you may have um, maybe 20% that don't return the original capital that was put in, which means you, you lost pretty good. Um, and then there's a very small percentage, like maybe two or 3% that just lose all the money and just like outright completely fail, uh, which is pretty rare, more or less because of this diversification. Sweater uh, is again, a little bit different because we'll be making 200 or 300 or, or maybe 2000 or 3000 investments over the long haul. And it's called large portfolio theory. And when you invest in many, many companies and you look at the statistics behind that, your um, return profile changes dramatically. And that downside risk goes down to almost zero for that complete failure rate. We could still underperform public markets, 
but it's less likely that we'll do so. Um, but it also means that the upside is capped a little bit. You know, we're not going to return a 10x on your money over the next 10 years because we're not designed that way. Uh, whereas a traditional VC fund could do that, but it's also got a higher chance of failure, right? So this is one of the things that we believe is really good for the retail investor, for all of us, because you're putting your money into effectively like an index of private venture backed companies that's all professionally diligenced that we take care of after the fact and that we invest alongside other VCs. And you get the courtside seats to watch the game, right? And this is what one of the elements that we think is really, really good for the everyday investor to get exposure to the asset class, but not with all the risk associated with making one-to-one -one investments yourself. No, I, th I think this is really, really exciting. Uh, and, and I think I'm not the only one to find this exciting because actually we've got two questions of uh, asking basically when will Sweater open up to UK investors or to French investors, and I guess everywhere else. <laughs> That's a great question. And we're actively looking into it. I, I will say this. Um, we know that we can, but it is a bit of a mess to have to take a fund and register it in all of these other individual domains. So I just actually went on a trip. I, I didn't make it into uh, London or the EU sphere, uh, but I checked out Dubai and I checked out uh, Singapore and we're starting to make friends in those regions. London is another one that we're looking at really closely to take our US registered fund uh, I guess, registration approval and go and take it to these other domains and register it there so that others can also come in. Uh, but I'll tell you, like, it's, we are the equivalent, like the level of regulation that we deal with is much, much higher than a traditional VC fund. Traditional VC funds have a bunch of exemptions and stuff that allow them to operate a little faster. And that's one of the reasons, well, not even faster, but um, allow them to operate with less regulatory oversight. And the exchange for that means they can't take money from regular folks. We can take money from regular folks, which means we're held to a higher standard. And it's the equivalent of us being publicly traded, except that you can't go and trade our stock. So you can actually look up our, our ticker. Uh, we have a ticker. It's SWTRX. And the X on the back means that it's you can't trade it on a, on a public exchange. Um, we can buy your shares back, which is a different story altogether. Um, but yeah, so with that registration, we're very highly regulated, which means we should be able to take, you know, what is kind of the crown jewel in the world of a registration status with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and take that to domains in London, in Paris, in Dubai, in Singapore, so that others can participate and get exposure to the U.S. venture-backed asset class, which is part of our goal. But it's probably, you know, 24 months away before we are able to really pull the trigger on that, just because it's so expensive and onerous to, to navigate. And now a last question. Um, how do you see Sweater differentiate itself from other fundraising companies like Republic, WeFunder, Startup Engine, et cetera, that allows uh, retail investors to invest in early startup companies? Yeah, for sure. So um, when you look at the equity crowdfunding world, which is all the companies you just listed are all equity crowdfunding platforms. Uh, all of those platforms stem from a law that was passed in the US in 2012 called the Jobs Act. And the purpose of that was to open up the private asset class for regular folks to be able to invest. Um, what most people don't realize is that it took four years of rulemaking after the fact from the Securities and Exchange Commission to write the rules around it to actually implement it so that it could be regulated. Um, and that's the way it works, at least in the US. You pass a law that's 200 pages long, you hand that to the agency that then has to implement it, and they write 2,000 pages worth of rules around it. Um, which is amazing that they have that much power, honestly. Um, but when they did that, that's how equity crowdfunding portals came to be because the Securities and Exchange Commission said, this is the only safe way to do this. But when they did that, they kind of bastardized the whole process because they, they created such an onerous amount of uh, requirements around it that it created stigmas inside the venture industry. So when you go to Republic and you go to Start Engine and these other uh, companies, they're wonderful companies and they're, they're great founders. But from our assessment, they fall, going back in our conversation, those five tiers and strata, they fall mostly in that bottom two thirds. Only 5% or probably less fall in those upper two thirds that are venture backable and that have VCs actively involved in them. So you as an individual, yeah, you can go to Start Engine, you can go to WeFunder and these other places, and you can invest in those companies directly. But you're fundamentally investing in a very different type of company that has a much lower potential return profile than if you invest alongside VC funds and alongside angels in venture backable companies. And that's the biggest difference. I love the founders to death that are raising platforms and the investors that invest there, I think are, are wonderful. 
but it's fundamentally a different type of investment. And the risk profile is just very, very different. So from our perspective, we only invest alongside other VC funds. We are professional investors. We create the portfolio on your behalf, which is another thing you don't get if you invest in one-off companies on Start Engine. Um, a quick rule of thumb on that is that to get the uh, portfolio effect to offset your risk, you need to make 30 investments. How many people that are on Start Engine or WeFunder are making 30 investments? Very, very few, which means that their chance of losing all their money is just really high. So I'm, I'm grateful that they're there. Lots of companies have raised money that wouldn't have raised otherwise and got resources to build their dreams. And I think that's awesome. Uh, from an investment perspective, though, I think as we've designed this, we made this a fundamentally different type of investment asset. Um, and we're doing it professionally on your behalf um, in a way that we hope provides a much more secure type of return profile, although never guaranteed, right? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Jesse. Uh, I'm afraid that's uh, that's all the time uh, for today. Uh, but thank you so much for joining us uh, uh, today, uh, everyone. Thank you so much, Jesse, for um, for uh, for this discussion. I hope this has been very enlightening and, and informative for you for you all. Now, please fill out the feedback form that should pop up uh, after this event finishes. Oh, yeah, it pops up right after. Sorry, and see you all at the next event. Thanks again, Jesse, and thanks everyone for joining. Take care. Yeah, thanks. See ya. Cheers.